Guys, uh, if you are brand new, you wouldn't have heard that about a month ago, I, atta- well, I was attacked by a wasp uh, nest. Okay, so I call them yellow jackets. I don't know what they're really called. I got stunned six times in the space of about 30 seconds. And then I felt really bad and had no idea why, because I'm not very smart. So the next day I got stung again, and it's been okay since then, until today. Today I was drinking a sugary beverage, and I put it down. And when I picked it back up and took a sip, there was something in the sip that I took. And I didn't know what it was, and I thought it was really gross, so I reached in and pulled out a yellow jacket. Now, it didn't sting my mouth, which I kind of wish it would have, because Lindsay would be reading this, it'd be hilarious. But um, (laughs) it was alive still, it was swimming in that sugary drink, and I went ahead and just sent it right to be heaven. So um, (laughs) I am super terrified. They're coming for me. They have have a lock on me, and they're coming for me. Um, And I think it's appropriate because tonight I'm talking about evil and they are evil. They're horrible. I know they serve some purpose in the world and we're all going to die if they go away, but I, you know, that's okay. So I'm talking about evil tonight. Uh, It's it's a message that uh, honestly, I've been, since we started Genesis, looking towards these next few weeks and being like, I have to do that. (laughs) And I'm kind of nervous, but I'm excited as well. I don't want you to think of when you think of evil. Uh, for me, like I can remember some of the first times as a kid experiencing stuff that, that was evil feeling or scared me. Uh, one of the biggest ones, and I'm, I'm going to expose my, uh, my, my nerdery to you here for a second. Uh, I rebelled in middle school by reading books my parents said I couldn't. That's the kind of nerd level that you're on tonight. So uh, I wanted to read this specific book and I kept begging my parents to let me read it. They kept saying no. And so I finally just snuck it home and I would read it late at night with a flashlight under a blanket. <laughs> it was kind of scary. It was Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. okay? I was, uh, I think I was in seventh grade, uh, maybe seventh or eighth grade. And I, to this day, can still remember how horrifying it was. <laughs> I was so scared, but I had to finish it. And then I made it all the worse by uh, the movie was coming out. And I, was, I told my parents, I was like, the movie's going to come out. I'm going to see it. They're like, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. And all my friends will know what happened and I won't. So then the movie comes out in 1989 and Pet Cemetery is the most horrifying movie I've ever seen in my life. Do not watch it. I still don't like cats because of it. If you're a cat person, watch Pet Cemetery. It'll cure what ails you real quick because it is... <laughs> horrifying, a horrifying movie, a horrifying book. But here's what I remember as like a 11 year old reading this book. It was dark and it just felt wrong. It felt evil. It felt like something more was going on. It struck right to my heart. And of course, as I got older, uh, I'm now in in, somewhere in my 40s, I think. And as I got older, I started to realize that there's real life evil things. Uh, real life things that are hard to reconcile, things that, 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 you know, they never seem to end. It seems like every week we have another one in the news or even in our real lives. You know, I still remember waking up and we just went past this anniversary uh, on September 11th, 2001. I was in grad school. I got to sleep in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And one of my friends came banging on my door yelling, something just happened, right? Something just happened. I remember thinking in that moment when he woke me up, something's about to happen. But um, <laughs> What, ha- what actually happened was I turned on the TV and with the rest of America, I watched in shock and horror as I saw something that, that was obviously evil, something that was really, really, really evil. Um, and, and that hasn't changed. There's, there's stuff all the time. I feel like every time I turn around, there, there's something else that I can kind of point to and say that felt like something was scary or something wasn't right. Uh, some of you might maybe know I went to Columbine High School. I graduated three years before Columbine. And I still know watching the, those, those tapes and to this day when I look at them, I can just feel the evil. The thing that you can't even understand how somebody can get like that, right? We read about the Holocaust. I, I got to go to a Holocaust museum in Los Angeles in high school and you could feel the evil, right? The Keen Super shooting, as I kind of watched that unfold in Boulder here not that long ago, you feel the evil. We hear stories of human trafficking. We hear stories of kidnapping. We hear what people do to kids. It's evil. All of it just feels like it's, it's something otherworldly. It's present. It's around. And it always has been, right? And from the start of the world, we get this story as we've been, we're in week eight of Genesis right now, which is crazy, week eight of Genesis. But we get this story all the way back to the first few weeks uh, of Satan in the garden tempting Adam and Eve. Some people want that to be something different, right? but, but here we are, we're reading the story of this temptation, of this evil that gets in the way of, of Adam and Eve's relationship with God. 
And sometimes I think it gets lost that some of the, the behaviors and stories that we've studied over the last eight weeks are, again, stories of evil, stories of, of Satan's presence and, and Satan's uh, power to, to influence decisions of human beings. They're, they're, the evil and the darkness is present through so many of these Genesis stories. And they're not just ideas. I really believe that they're real obstacles to these people that we read about and to us today. So we have these hallmark, kind of these big moments like 9-11 or like Columbine that, that mark us and leave us with this, this gutted, almost empty feeling, this, this kind of hazy brain, fearful state, right? And people will say a lot of times to me, hasn't the world turned crazy? And I think, yeah, it has. <laughs> but, but isn't the world nuts? Aren't, but aren't things like, they're just not the way they used to be. And the truth is, the evil's always been with us. Like these kinds of, of stories and these kinds of feelings, like they've, they've always been here. And the evil that exists in the hearts and minds of people who commit atrocities, like some of these things I talked about, it might not be quite as foreign or hard to grasp as I might feel sometimes. The truth is this, is that that evil has always existed and in some form is present in each one of us too. Now the question is this, how do we combat it? How do we deal with it? And ultimately, what do we believe about good and what do we believe about evil? So over these last eight weeks, this Genesis study, we've seen already that God comes against the folly, like the bad ideas, the bad decisions of human beings again and again. And so I'm going to do like, it's like a little bit of a semi-review, but I want to use it more of a reset to get us to where we are tonight as we, uh, we tackle Genesis 18. So God's made it clear from the start that he wants his people to be what's called holy, which means set apart. He wants his people to pay attention to his ways. He wants people to, to move and breathe and, and have, their, have their being in him to live the way that he says is best. He created this beautiful world and he doesn't just give it to people, he chooses us. He chooses to make people kind of his co-heirs, his co-rulers of this world. And then as we've seen over and over again, it goes horribly wrong. He decides that because we're creatures of free will, because he's gonna let us make our own minds up and we're not gonna make us robots or, or programmed for his glory, that we keep choosing something else. So here's, here's what we keep coming back to. These stories sometimes make it seem like God doesn't know that people are going to do this, right? And it's literary devices. It's the way it was written. God knows everything. God knew from the start that all this is going to happen. So it's not that it's a surprise to him, but it's that humans continue to choose sin as a matter of breaking these agreements called covenants. So what, what God's really looking at is this. He keeps saying, I give you this agreement. I give you this covenant that if you just live this way, then I will be this kind of God for you, a God who looks after you, a God who, who is pleased with you, a God who says that everything is good. But we can't remain obedient and faithful to those things because of our sinful nature. So we've seen God again and again in the last eight weeks place trust in a number of people and make these agreements, these covenants with them. Adam and Eve, Noah, now Abraham, as Lindsay kind of traced some of those last week. He's, he's, well, we've received a handful of these promises in exchange for obedience. And so Abraham in this place, uh, as we highlighted last week, is very attuned to what God is asking. And Abraham is making these decisions and, and these actions that are full of both faith and adventure, right? They're full of risk. And really, the thing that sets Abraham apart from people like me is they're full of radical obedience. And that's what we talked about a few weeks ago. And we watched a few weeks ago that God had had enough of humanity, right? He was watching them perform evil acts and ignore the fact that he commanded them to do better. And so he sent this flood, the famous Noah story. We see Noah as the most, he's called the most righteous person on the earth. He's the person that God can find making this covenant agreement with Noah uh, as a possibility to reestablish the world with this brand new way of living that, that is close to God and his ways. But instead, immediately, as Lindsay taught us about three weeks ago, the people in Babylon conspire to build a tower to reach heaven and to get to God and be like him. And so he scatters them. He sends them out all across the world. And then over the last few weeks, we see that he picks out Abram, who becomes Abraham, and his family, his wife, Sarah. And we see that even his nephew, Lot, that we're going to look at tonight, that he chooses them to be his people. That even though they're people and even though they're going to make mistakes, he still chooses to go that route. Even last week, we saw them make some pretty rough decisions. If you want to read backwards uh, when you get home, there's some pretty rough decisions that were made in Lindsay's talk last week. And if we're being honest, they were decisions that were made out of fear and anger and entitlement. They were really decisions made out of this attitude, I've, if, like, I deserve something better. God, I've, I've been through all this and I've done all this. I deserve it now, so I'm going to come and get it. So first 17 chapters of Genesis, here we are 
chapter 18. So I'm going to pick up the narrative. I'm going to summarize some of it and share some of it tonight. Lindsay mentioned last week that that Abram and Lot had a disagreement. And it was a disagreement that we don't need to get into. But what what it ended up doing was instead of them starting a war with each other, they chose to go to different places. So Abraham goes to Canaan. And and Lot goes and he settles down in this this plain, this pasture land uh, around many settlements. And one of them is called Sodom, which is probably a place that most of us have heard of. And Sodom is a place that is synonymous with evil, right? This idea that we've been looking at already tonight of evil. I think most of us are at least somewhat familiar with with both Sodom and its sister city, Gomorrah, that are dealt with in this passage. But before I unpack all that story, uh, I want to say this. The tale of Sodom and Gomorrah for the entire rest of the Bible becomes a kind of cautionary tale. It's a tale that the, from this point forward, the prophets use. So we, we see people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who are famous prophets in the Old Testament, that warn Israel, God's chosen people, over and over again, that they could become kind of the next Sodom if they don't, if they don't get you know, their stuff in order and keep the covenants and the agreements with God. They could become the next place to, to, to meet this fate that we're going to see tonight. And then in the New Testament, Jesus himself even uh, brings up this concept. He says this, he says, the cities that are unrepentant or unwelcoming of my disciples can expect a fate that is what he calls worse than we're about to see happen to Sodom tonight. So my spoiler alert is this, what we see happen to Sodom tonight is pretty crazy, it's pretty devastating. And when Jesus says people who don't welcome my disciples can expect worse, that's a big deal. So here we are in Genesis 18, we have Abraham. So Abraham has what I think is probably the most interesting relationship with God that we've certainly seen in the Bible to this point, and maybe totally. Uh, when you study scripture and see this, I think this maybe tonight is the most interesting of all of it to me, at least so far. So I'm gonna pick that story up right there in Genesis 18. Abraham, is, he's hanging out in what's described as the, the heat of the day at his tent, right? And so he lives the life of a nomad. And if you are not new here, you've been around for a little bit, you know that I despise camping. Okay. So I'm reading this story and watching Abraham and his family who live basically a life of camping. They're sweating all day in the heat of the day. Uh, They they, they certainly smell bad. And I'm guessing they do what I do when I go camping. And what I do is I look for any excuse I can to go find a Starbucks, right? I'm like, does anybody need anything at all? Is anybody injured? Does anybody uh, like, I'll go to the DMV for you. What do you you need? (laughs) I imagine that Abraham's dreaming of something like that, a respite to this life, this, this, this life of sitting around and sweating with no hot shower coming later, right? But he has three men approach him in this moment. As he's in the heat of the day in his tent, these three men that he's never seen before, these strangers walk up. And Abraham immediately welcomes them with what we see to be a, kind of a, an unparalleled act of hospitality. He goes out of his way to meet their every need. He gives them some of the basics like water to drink, uh, water to wash up with, because as some of us know that in their time, they'd be walking in some pretty rough shoes. They probably have all kinds of sheep, everything all over them. And so he gives them a, a way to get water and to get clean. And then he goes and asks his wife, Sarah, to make them a very specific meal. He gives a, a really certain recipe for this bread that she, that she will make for them. Then he slaughters a calf and even makes this kind of cheese curd appetizer, which to me sounds horrifying, but I know some of you are from Wisconsin. That probably sounds great, right? So he brings them in with this great meal and sets everything up really nicely and just takes care of them. And I can't help when I read this in Genesis 18 to think this is interesting, but then it gets kind of strange, right? So remember, these strangers have shown up. They've seen nobody but Abraham, and they sit down in the shade of the tree with Abraham uh, right outside his tents that he calls home. And they say this, verse 9 in chapter 18. One of them said, where is your wife, Sarah? So cue the creepy music. We got a stalker situation. We got one of these Stephen King horror movies going on. These people seem to know not only that Abraham has a wife, but they know her name. And they're asking specific questions about her, right? So Abraham says, he doesn't seem too bothered. He says, she's in the tent over there. And then another one of them says this says, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, again, it's a kind of a weird thing for a stranger to say under your tree in your yard, but that's what he gets. If you've been with us or you know the story well, you know this. You know that Abraham and Sarah are advanced in age. They're in their 90s. But something has just shifted in this conversation because Sarah, in her 90s, is listening behind the tent's entrance, and she laughs. Like, we don't know if she laughs because it's a ludicrous idea, We don't know if she laughs out of some kind of like bitter feeling towards that idea that that she could have a baby, but we do know that she she finds it uh, laughable. 
And she, she sees the, and hears that maybe this dream of having a child will finally be fulfilled. And if you were here last week, you heard Lindsay talk and, and teach about the way they've already tried to do this. It's a little bit of a sketchy situation. And they're still sitting here in their 90s now waiting. Now this passage, it, it holds some euphemisms that are pretty important to this. I hold some euphemisms that tell us a few things. It tells us that Sarah herself is probably past, or certainly past the age of, of childbearing biologically. And it also says, uh, I'm going to put this delicately. It just says basically this, that um, that tent hasn't been a rockin' for quite some time before these strangers come a knockin', okay? So Sarah maybe is laughing because she's like, yeah, right, okay? Yeah, right, right? So... One of the visitors now at this time plays his hand and he says, I'm not just some angel or some, some you know, special being. I am the Lord in the flesh. Now, if somebody says that in one of our houses, we do call 911 at this point. But in this story, Abraham seems to get it. Abraham understands that God has come to him in person, that God has come to tell him this message in person. And that's what God says to him. He says, why does Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? then this is the, the key, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, there's a lot going on here, but I, I want to pull a few things out of it that I think are good for us to think about, and it's this. It starts this way. He just heard, we just heard, that the Lord, that God in the flesh, he made a promise. He's saying to Abraham and Sarah, you may be at a point where you think this agreement or this covenant that we made, when I told you that you would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, that all of history would rest on you, that every single line of human beings would come from you, you're probably thinking at this point that I either forgot or I lied or something else. But he's looking at them and saying this, I haven't. My promise to you, I still remember. I still intend on fulfilling it. And even as they're growing old and think that that time has passed them, he shows up and says, all of it is still true. Everything that I've promised you is still true. I don't know about you, but I've been thinking this week as I read this, how many times this kind of concept has been true in my life, right? Where I felt like God promised me something. Uh, maybe it was something that I read in scripture or a feeling I got praying, something in my spirit. Maybe it's something that I've waited and waited for. And I continue to think, may, and maybe you're still waiting, and I continue to think maybe he's gonna show up and it's gonna happen, but with each month, each year, each passing moment, I start to think maybe it's never going to happen. I think that happens so many times for all of us, right? Here's what God's reminded, reminded us here with simple words. He's saying, is anything too hard for the Lord? Here's what he's telling us. This will pass. This season will go away. And the promise that I gave you will still be true. Now, whether it happens when you want it to or not is a different story. Like Lindsay taught last week, waiting is the hard part, right? But waiting is also the part of the blessing that shows us how good it is when God finally fulfills that promise. How perfect his timing is, even when it feels wrong to us. And, and that's the kind of God that made this covenant agreement with Abraham and Sarah. It's the kind of God that we still follow. Because it's the kind of God that comes through in timings that always ends up being perfect, even when we can't see it. And the next thing that's going on here in this passage is this. Abraham and Sarah treat these strangers with such regard that it's actually a very important theological detail and moment. See, the logic here is this. Abraham probably felt some kind of stirring from the Holy Spirit that told him that these three men that were approaching were divine, right? And maybe he had a feeling or maybe he knew or maybe, or maybe something was going on there where he knew that maybe one of them was God. But Abraham and Sarah's hospitality is really is a key to the development of this entire passage, Abraham is practicing one of the most important things, one of the most important commands, one of the most important way, uh, ways of life that the nation of Israel that follows his line, the nation of God's chosen people that all these prophets wrote to about Sodom later and warned them about. He, he's practicing one of the most important things, which is treating the alien, treating the stranger, treating the foreigner better than themselves, giving them everything that they have. And in fact, this passage right here is in part setting us up for the contrast of the city Sodom that we're about to look at. And, and, and really, it, it, we're about to encounter, it's going to show us that, that the unhospitable Sodomites, really, to strangers and foreigners, were treating them in such a horrible way that, that Abraham is set up as the complete opposite. Some scholars actually believe this. They believe that the Sodom and Gomorrah story, for all the stuff that's in it that we're about to look at, that they think it's really just about the lesson of hospitality to strangers. So I'm going to circle back to that here in just a moment. 
But again, Abraham's friendship with God is the kind of friendship that shows up again here in verse 17 as God and his angel friends decide to leave the tent and get on uh, with their business. God turns and says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I think it's not really a question, right? If somebody was leaving my house and said that, and certainly if somebody was in my house that I had a good feeling was God and said, shall I hide from Zach what I'm about to do? I'd say, please tell me. I'd love to know, right? I'll go put some money on it. No, I don't know. Um, so he's, he's walking by and he says that. And then he says this, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry, hold on to that word, that has reached me. If not, I will know. So again, obviously God knows what's going on in this city, right? What he's, what he's communicating to Abraham here is keyed by the use of this word outcry. So just like the story about the Tower of Babel that Lindsay taught, God says he came down to see if it was as bad as he as had heard. He knew, but he chooses to participate and be with us in these moments. See, in this word outcry, he's telling Abraham something really specific. He's telling Abraham there are voices rising from the depths that are telling him and crying out to him that they're being specifically, uh, specifically hurt, that injustice is ruling in the city and that people are being treated in the most horrible, horrible ways. And we're about to look at this. It's set up as, the, again, the exact opposite way that Abraham had just treated the stranger, the foreigner, the alien. God's telling Abraham here, the people in Sodom are sinning in ways that's destroying the image of God and their fellow people. And that is pure evil. So Abraham shows another layer of this friendship with the creator of the universe by then attempting to negotiate on behalf of Sodom. So he says, I'm going to go destroy this city who is destroying people. I'm going to go destroy these people who are taking the image of God away from my creation. And of course, uh, Abraham has a different uh, stake in this entire thing too. His nephew Lot, that, that parted with him, he knows that he lives close to this city. He knows that he's down there. So he says to God, what if I can find 50 uh, godly people, 50 honorable people, would you spare the city for 50 people? And, and God looks at him and says, no. Abraham continues to argue with him. And, and he says this, Abraham says, God, I am gonna advocate for them even though their difference of lifestyle and actions and beliefs is, is reprehensible to me. See, Abraham didn't cheer the demise of a place that he would have totally disagreed with, a place that he would have seen as the worst of the worst. Instead, he keeps trying to advocate for them over and over again. He bargains God all the way down to sparing the city if even 10 righteous people can be found there. Now, again, for God, who's all-knowing, is all-seeing, he knows what kind of city he's dealing with. And he knows that despite Abraham's huge heart, despite Abraham's pleas for mercy, God knows that those 10 people do not exist in the city of Sodom. So what we're left with is something horrible. The, the angels that left Abe's camp, so God goes and leaves, and the two other angels, they travel to Sodom. And what they do is they encounter Lot when they reach the city gates. So Lot who, who's there, and perhaps these angels are hoping that they'll experience some kind of uh, hospitality like they got from Abraham. Or maybe they're, they're wondering, or maybe they already know. But when they, when they encounter Lot at, at the city gates, what they find out is that they're about to be set up for the exact opposite. Lot does invite them to his house, but he offers them very little in the way. It's purposely set up to be that, that he didn't offer the same things that, that, that Abraham did in the same manner. But the most interesting thing that happens is that the, the angels say to him, we actually don't want to go to your house. Now, for them to say, we don't want the safety of a household, they say, we'd rather sleep in the city square. At this time, it would basically be saying, we'd rather take our chances with being murdered in the night than be in your house. Which, if somebody said that to me after I invited him over, it would be pretty hurtful. But Lot is, 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 is able to convince them to come over to his house where he puts on this subpar hospitality, uh, but he at least tried a little bit, right? But here's what, here's what, here we are in Sodom. And as the night in Sodom goes on, we see just how bad this city has gotten and just how, how terrible the situation is. Now, some of you in here already are wondering this because Sodom is famous for certain kinds of sin. Right? It's obvious that there's a very open sexuality in this city uh, by the passage we're about to read. It's also obvious that the, the famous same-sex pursuits that we've heard of are going on, but it's not as obvious what that means or what actually is happening. So I want to read it together and then read a couple supporting uh, scriptures with it. Because scripturally, I think it's not all that's going on. It's not even close. 
I think that what we actually have here in the city of Sodom is a city that is lost in every single possible way. So verse 19, 4 says this. Before they went to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to you, so that we, or bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. And if you're like me, your immediate question is, what just happened, right? What is going on? Or as the philosopher Ron Burgundy says, that escalated quickly, right? <laughs> what is going on in the city of Sodom? These men were just hanging out, washing their feet, having a little water, and this happens, right? Well, the people of Sodom aren't just poor hosts, right? They, and they certainly are poor hosts. But they're actually, what we're looking at here is, is a kind of a dynamic that I think bled into every facet of how they lived. The people in Sodom are violent, power-hungry, cruel people. And like I said earlier, this story became a cautionary tale that the Old Testament prophets and Jesus used for a lot of reasons. But here's how Ezekiel puts it when he's telling Israel later on that they could become this. He says this. He says, This was the sin of your sister city, Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty, and they did detestable things before me. And then Jeremiah says this later. He tells us that Sodom was overrun by adultery, that Sodom was a city where people were living a life that was based on lies. And then he says, quote, they were strengthening the hands of evildoers. Now, this was a place, uh, this scene above, this was a place where everything was working together for the worst possible outcomes. And what we just saw uh, at, at the door of Lot, I want to be really plain about what we saw. We saw a passage that's about assault, not about any kind of sexual relations. It's about assault. It's about power. So we have a picture of absolute depravity in Sodom. It's a society that misuses power and resources. It's a city that looks to protect its own way of life by attacking the outsiders that come in and threaten it. See, evil sees good too. And they would have had a feeling about these two angels that came into their square as well. Here's what we know about this. Those that benefit most from, from kind of the disorder of sin always want it to continue. Those who benefit most from, from harm to other people always continue the harm. We see this all over our modern world, and Sodom was absolutely no different. Today, just as then, when the truth is brought to light, and abusers and power, power mongers, and, 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 uh, and, and honestly, people who are assaulting other people, when it comes to light, what they do is their instinct is to lie about it, right? To make the victims look guilty, or to discredit them altogether. It's the instinct to protect the sinful pattern at all costs and to cast doubt on that truth being told, to hope that nobody believes it. The power always protects power, and the city of Sodom citizens seem to be more than okay with this arrangement that they'd figured out and lived in. And also for his part, the nephew Lot seems to have settled in pretty nicely as well. In fact, this, this commentary that I use, that's one of the most reputable kind of commentaries in, in academic circles, it says that the whole point of the Sodom and Gomorrah story is just to show the Israelites later on that what, what the consequences of being inhospitable power brokers, uh, what the consequences of being looking out for number one, what the consequences of treating people poorly actually are. And for that reason, Lot becomes this perfect character foil for Abraham. Now, Abraham really is this. He's essentially, he's just argued with God for the, for the salvation of Sodom, right? He's asked, are, are there even 10 good people if God would spare it? And then we see Lot, who's described as the most righteous person in Sodom. Right? It's like a pig winning a beauty contest. It's like the, the, the most righteous person in Sodom. He tries to protect the visitors, and we're not really sure why. What he ends up doing is instead of saying, you know, get away, or instead of fighting them, he offers to these, to these men in the square who want to assault somebody, his daughters. He says, I have two daughters right here. Why don't you take them? We don't know why he would sell his own family out this way. We don't know what the situation really, why, why, why he chooses to go that route. But it does take at this moment, God's divine intervention to make something different happen. Because as Lot is desperately uh, pleading to, and trying to figure out the situation, maybe he was just at a loss. What we see is all of, this, all of the men who are there to assault are blinded by this bright light and the two angels take uh, Lot and his wife and his two daughters and they flee the city. And there's some other things that happen in here that, that are important for us tonight. But here's what we're looking at. 
Lot and his wife, who were probably getting up there in age as well, as they're, as they're leaving the city, start to bargain with these angels to get something closer. They settle on the city, but they're told, don't look back at Sodom. And really the euphemism there is, don't turn around and pretend like you were still in Sodom. And as they start to leave, Lot's wife does turn around. And there's speculation. Maybe she turned around because her daughter's husbands were there and she was scared. Maybe she turned around because she just wanted to see something crazy happen because she knew it was about to. But maybe she turned around because she already missed this kind of crazy life that she'd carved out in this place. But in any case, she turns around and we're told that she's turned into a pillar of salt. I was talking with somebody out here. They, they think this, actually this last week, they think they found Sodom, like uh, geographically. And, this, and the city of Sodom, uh, around it, the, 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 the soil is rich with salt. So whatever happens in this story, because what's happening right now is that Sodom is being exploded from the inside out. Whatever happened in that moment, when Lot's wife, who doesn't even get a name, turns around and looks at the city, she is showered with salt and becomes this kind of petrified uh, vision uh, of the city of Sodom and what happened to it. Lot stumbles away with just his two daughters. And, and as he tries, he, he has these two girls that he just tried to trade to an angry mob. He, he ends up getting just the three of them out. And Lot, his life is spared, and it's not because he was good, right? When he's described as the most righteous person in a really terrible place, right, we, we don't get mistake that he was actually a good person. Scripture says this in chapter 19. It says, when God destroyed those cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. So stop there for a second. It doesn't say Lot was so great that he took him out. It says he remembered Abraham, which is telling us this. He remembers that agreement, that covenant that he made with Abraham. We said, Abraham, if you follow my ways, right, if you go and practice this radical, crazy obedience, I will make your family the line that I live through. I will make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. He remembered that. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. And God's agreement, God's promise stands up even under this person Lot, even through this crazy city that he lived in. Now, if you're bored later when you get home and you want to see the kind of one of the craziest passages of Scripture, I invite you to go to the very next verse in chapter 19, verse 30, because Lot's daughters that he tried to trade off to this group of assaulters, they get some revenge. It's one of the most disturbing things I've ever read, and it's definitely NC-17. So if your kid goes to bed with the Bible tonight, take that Bible away for this one time, okay? It's a crazy story. It's a little bit of light reading before you go to bed. But here's where we're left. In this story of Sodom, and, the, and this place and, the, and this thing that God's doing. Here's what we learn through these kinds of stories, right? Because in the Bible, we see stories like this. I think maybe this is the most clear example of a city that, that sets up a pattern and, and turns into a really sinful place. And I think that we always see probably several things happening, but I, I picked out these four that I think we always see happening in sinful places, both in the Bible and I think even probably today. We see a general lack of morality, right? People don't really care. We see a loss of a center. Uh, God uh, certainly would be the biggest one, especially in the Bible. We see fierce individualism, people looking out for number one, people ignoring the stranger and the alien, the people ignoring those on the margins who have nothing. And we see a focus on other people's sin before their own. People saying, if I can just be better than the worst, then I'll be okay. In Sodom, these things were definitely present. In Sodom, all of these wrongs uh, we're, we're crying, the, the people who were wrong were crying out for justice, and God heard them. Now, the hospitality that Abraham displayed was really this. Abraham's hospitality was really just inviting and welcoming the divine into his everyday life. It's precisely what Lot couldn't do and what Sodom wouldn't do, which is this. It's really this. To open up everything that we are, everything that we, that we have, everything that we think about and dream about, everything that we worry about, everything that we, that we fear, and saying, God, you're invited into every single part of who I am. We know this about God. God has told us from the very start of the Bible that he can't exist alongside evil. So we know that God will always destroy evil in the end. And whether it's through an explosion like the city of Sodom saw, whether it's through a wall of salt like Lot's wife saw, or whether it's through something so much better, which is the patience and love that Jesus gives to every single one of us. God gets the last word in every single one of our stories. And to our credit as people who follow Jesus, that only word is Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And all of this, the study of Genesis, all the stories that, 
when I read them, I'm reminded how just crazy some of them are. All the concepts that we've been pointing out, Genesis, that are foundational to why we as Christians in 2021 follow after Jesus. Tonight's is this. The judgment, the destruction of Sodom is because of what we call the doctrine of wrath. Now, wrath is this. Wrath is God's measured response to our sin. Every single one of us are carrying it. Every single one of us have it. He tells us that the consequence of breaking the covenants, the agreements, the consequences of not being able to keep up with, with his call to us to, to just be sacrificial, to just not sin, to just keep his laws. He tells us that that penalty is death, right? Whether it's the Ten Commandments that we're going to study here in, in, in probably a few months or all the things that follow it in the Old Testament. But as evidenced by Sodom's demise, for the people in the Old Testament, that result, that doctrine of wrath, of, of God giving what we deserve, God giving what we ask for, is literal fire and brimstone. Do as God commands or meet an awful end. But for those of us who follow Jesus, we live in what we call the new covenant. And if you never heard that before, it's this. It's the agreement that God made with his people through Jesus instead of through our own behaviors and actions. It's the agreement he made that through Jesus' perfect life, Jesus' death, and Jesus' resurrection, that he has defeated death and defeated sin for all time. And that when we break the boundaries of that agreement, and when we break the boundaries of his perfection for our sin that we choose, or when something's done to us that breaks that, when we call on the name of Jesus, the only name that can save, the only name that can cleanse us, the only name that can set us on a better path, what we get instead, we don't face that fire, right? We, we don't face that destruction, but, but instead we get to lean into this ability to get better little by little through Jesus and Jesus only. And I think this, the, the best we can do with a, a cautionary tale like Sodom and Gomorrah is to remember this. We're in this together. Every single one of us, even in our disagreements, even in our tough times, even in the places where we don't see things the same, we have to remember that all of our behaviors, whether they're right or wrong, all of our missteps, all of our mistakes, we again and again, we get Jesus instead of what we might deserve. When those sins and those patterns persist, our way out of it isn't lying or hiding or blaming or saying what about them. It's to welcome in the divine into the middle of our story, into the middle of our life, into the middle of what we're going through. It's to ask Jesus to move again in our lives because he's good and I'm not. Because he can defeat my sin, he can, he can defeat death, and I can't. It's Jesus who's before us, it's Jesus who's next to us, and it's Jesus who forges a path for us to walk in righteousness with him alone. So let's pray. God, I'm thankful uh, for stories like this one, which is crazy to say, I think. But God, here's why I'm thankful. I'm thankful because I'm reminded that no matter how far we get from you, individually or collectively, that your agreement's different for us. You've agreed to us that Jesus is all that matters. That when we call on his name, that when we ask him to take away death, to take away sin, when we ask him to show us a path that's better for us and better with him, that you give it to us time and time again. We love you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.